I'd like to welcome you to the uh, beginning of our new lecture series for this term. Um, Marcus Novak is back with us again. The reason he's back is because I missed his lecture, and I heard it was great. So I thought, well, let's invite him back for another pass. It's a different, uh, it's a different situation here too. It's a little more intimate. It's more like a seminar setting, and I'd like you to treat it that way. So if during this presentation you have a question or a comment or something like that, just say it, you know. Let's make this more of a conversation than a just kind of a one-way thing. Marcus is involved in this kind of complex situation in his work. It's part of why I find it really interesting. So let's make this let's make this session itself complex, okay? So anytime you have an, some input, uh, it, put it in. Um, there are several people I'd like to thank uh, who've made this series possible. I'd first like to thank Michael Rotundi because this is something that he's believed in for several years and has really helped get it off the ground. And now that we discovered uh, feeding you, I don't know what we'll have to do once you get used to being fed. So I have to find some other entertainment to go along with this thing. But so far, um, more and more people are come, coming. I, I hope it's partly because people actually enjoy this thing on um, full stomach or not. Um, and I'd like to thank Patrick Caldwell, um, who's really helped pull this whole thing together. He, he's supposedly pinch hitting now, but he's still doing just as much work as ever. And uh, I'd like to thank Keith, who uh, I think of Keith as kind of a fallen angel, very fallen, but they're an angel never, nevertheless, just because no matter how much he grumbles and everything like that, he, he always comes through. And so we're going to have this film, we're, gonna, we're going to have this filmed once again. Third point I'd like to make is to invite, uh, I, I said Marcus was here just because I missed his lecture, which is true. I was on a jury with him and I realized, wow, I wonder, I wonder what this guy's work is like. Um, but I said that in order to challenge you to do the same thing. This is your lecture series. This is your, this is your tuition dollars at work or play, as the case may be. And you should assert your authority over it. And very few of you have, have made recommendations to me but I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that you would like to come and engage with. And all you have to do is tell me. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna have a student run one of these in February. She suggested, no, it's gonna be in the middle of March. She suggested the people, it's gonna be a debate. She's going to line up the people, get them here, take charge of the whole thing. So I hope, uh, I hope you'll feel free to contact me or Patrick or anybody else uh, who works with me on this and give us your suggestions. It's designed to be short-term notice, like. There's going to be somebody in town next time from Turkey. It's a, it's a Turkish engineer who's a woman and head of the engineering department in their architecture school. And I, I think that's great. I think we need to encourage technical studies among women. So she's going to be flying through town, and I just pluck her out of the air. So this is something that this, this thing is very mobile. It's very flexible. So let me know what your suggestions are, OK? OK, I'll shut up. Marcus, thanks for coming. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be back. Uh, to uh, continue the, the conversation I, I began uh, last uh, semester for you, Porter, for, for us, and to uh, right any wrongs and fill any gaps that I might have uh, left. Um, is this microphone on? Hello? Hello? No. Do I have, is there a switch on? It's fine? Yeah. It's okay? Yeah. You can hear me back there? Okay. Uh, the um, well, I can still see uh, hands in the dark. Uh, how many of you actually made it to the talk uh, last uh, time? A few, a few of you didn't, uh, right? Or quite a few of you didn't. So I'm just trying to figure out how much is uh, redundant and how much uh, uh, can be repeated. I, I want to keep this interesting for you. Uh, let me. Um, Give you a little bit lay, a little bit of the lay of the land. Uh, what uh, what I'll have to to talk through and with is uh, essentially a set of slides that's going to be over there. This slide is a, a kind of backup for myself to make a particular point and it'll rest. And then here, what you're seeing is a documentary that uh, was made for uh, Japanese uh, television for the NHK, which is the equivalent of the BBC, uh, in, but in Japan on the theme of uh, the 21st century and in particular virtual reality. Uh, the, uh, I'm using it as a kind of uh, instant context for the kinds of comments that, uh, and observations that uh, 
uh, I'll make, and then at some point in there, uh, there'll be a little bit of me talking to this uh, Japanese person who gets into one of the virtual worlds, so there's a bit of a, a connection there. And then I have another video that'll interrupt this, and then we'll come back to this as a kind of background. So uh, there ought to be things to entertain you uh, all the while. Uh, let me begin <coughs> with uh, uh, a kind of uh, comment about this image, which is, as I said, a kind of a backdrop to, to myself. Uh, I'm going to show you a lot of things that are virtual. A lot of things are about cyberspace and virtual reality and about the immaterial and so on. Um, I'm going to do that, and I have been doing that for quite a long time, uh, because uh, it's a polemical point. Uh, I, I, I've been doing this kind of work for a long time, and I've begun, I began doing it before it had a name, and uh, found myself in opposition to people who would hold on to the the material uh, because they were afraid of a kind of substitution by the immaterial that cyberspace would take over. I never had that fear and I, I was always invested in the physical um, and indeed in my studios we work with anything uh, from the virtual to the, the literally organic or um, very much uh, uh, material and we, we make things of all sorts. Uh, so there's no boundary there. But there is a kind of polemical statement uh, uh, about uh, needing to refocus architectural attention to uh, new things in order to be uh, relevant. Uh, the other thing about this particular image, you might recognize it, <coughs> it's uh, the Poema Electronique, the, the, uh, the pavilion that was designed for Philips uh, for the 1958 exhibition. Uh, in Brussels, and uh, it was designed uh, by an unusual conjunction of people. It was designed by Corbusier, uh, whom I trust you know, and uh, Xenakis, uh, who was uh, an engineer who then went on to become a composer uh, and uh, who was largely responsible for this particular uh, building and was one of the people who invented computer music. Uh, and it also involved uh, a, a composer per se, but again, not a very typical composer, rather uh, um, an uh, uh, sort of rebel of sorts, uh, Edgar Varese, who is known for one of the major emancipations that characterize uh, 20th century music, uh, the emancipation of noise. He, would, he was one of the first people to incorporate noise into the making of serious music. Uh, so uh, here's a, a sort of conjunction in a building of these different arts. Uh, and, and also of scientific ideas that have to do with uh, uh, mathematics and geometry uh, and the way the world is known uh, from that part of our culture uh, into something that needs to be built in very physical way. And I've chosen to put the slide up here that is uh, the slide of the object in the making, the sort of in-process slide of this building, not the finished uh, design, uh, to indicate that uh, the kind of physical manifestation that I'm interested in and the kind of virtual manifestation that I'm interested in are both uh, about uh, being on a certain kind of edge and they beg a question of what is it or who is it that uh, is an architect. Uh, another strand that goes through all of these things before I ever get into, into this um, is that uh, the architect is the person uh, not necessarily who builds buildings out of uh, materials, but the, building who, the, the person who builds the edge of thought. Uh, so there's an, impl an implicit sense that for any given time, there is a boundary to what we know and what we don't know. And some people tread on the boundary of what we uh, know or don't know, and some people go over it and give form to the unknown, by which process it becomes the known. Uh, and those are people whom I would call architects with a capital A. Uh, and uh, in that conception, what you build your buildings of is not as important as what it is that you build them by or uh, what the sort of inherent uh, properties of those things are. OK, that's enough in terms of a general kind of discussion. Now let me get on with uh, some of these uh, slides. Uh, the first slides are the slides, this one here in particular, is the cover of a book called Cyberspace First Steps that is probably the, 
uh, probably still the most widely uh, known image that, uh, that I've concocted. Uh, it was done for the first cyberspace, the first international conference on cyberspace. It wound up being an MIT book, and uh, uh, there was an essay in there called Liquid Architectures in Cyberspace uh, that uh, got around a bit. And uh, that book uh, became rather notorious in that it, it is, I think, still uh, the most uh, widely circulated MIT Press book ever. Uh, it was quite quite an honor because it was such an unlikely subject at the time. Cyberspace was not uh, what it is now. It wasn't on everyone's uh, lips. Uh, what you're seeing here uh, is a sort of uh, abandonment of the horizon and the construction of a space that is entirely informational so that all the components, the textures and the, and the forms are made of some form of information that is intended to be animated and uh, liquid. And the actual artifact itself is actually uh, a parent and two uh, siblings that are evolved using artificial life techniques uh, so that that's, uh, there's, a, there's a genetic uh, description that has evolved to a certain point and then what I've done is I've taken that and evolved it uh, in another direction, uh, in one direction here and, and then in another direction there so that these two began as that and then diverged in their evolution to construct this kind of thing. And if you were to see this in its, in its uh, intended and actual uh, implementation, uh, but not its, uh, you know, not its rendition, if you, if you were to uh, visualize what happens in the program, what you would see is that uh, at each generation or each frame, there's a, there's a tiny fluctuation uh, here, and uh, the fluctuation uh, makes this a, a form that is uh, liquid. So this is really just a glimpse of something that is in perpetual motion and this is uh, uh, at, uh, I think that was at 30,000 uh, generations of that object and then these were 30, 30 more thousand so that would have evolved 60,000 steps and that would have also have evolved 60,000 steps but they would have diverged from that point. Uh, now some of the, the, the things that are implicit in what I'm saying that are, that are evident here and uh, that animate the way we know the world, uh, you know, which has to do with this idea of building the edge of thought, is how it is that we know what we know. What is it that allows us to peer into a living person's skull without ever cutting open that person, without uh, needing to have them cease functioning? Uh, and also the, the parallel idea of uh, things beneath the surface, scaffolds of information, uh, that hold together the, the things that we know and live by. Um, that's kind of an ideal for, for uh, the kinds of things that I would build, and that's also something that I observe in here in the, <coughs> the sort of mathematical uh, substratum that, that decides the, the particulars of the curves that go into this form. Uh, this image here is, uh, uh, again, to do with, uh, with this way of knowing that is uh, our way of knowing. It's really to be seen in juxtaposition to the notion of collage, uh, where the notion of collage is one which characterizes modernist aesthetic uh, and which is one of putting things that are out of context into juxtaposition by an active, uh, uh, I would say, lightweight uh, overlay, that things don't really permeate one another, they simply lay over each other like sheets of paper. Uh, in this instance, the operation is radically different. We know this now as morphing, but at the time that this was done uh, by Nancy Burson here, uh, the word morphing didn't exist. Uh, these are averages of shapes of uh, faces taken in the proportions uh, in which different races are found on the planet uh, to create an imaginary person uh, who uh, uh, is nonetheless tied to particular information. That there's a, there's a sort of uh, overlapping of rigor and uh, the fictional. This person doesn't exist, and yet the data that make him, make him or her up, it's kind of hard to tell, uh, uh, are uh, uh, real uh, data. Um, this operation is not mechanical, it's alchemical. And it relies on the notion of the, of the of a field of information, in this case a field of pixels, uh, 
that have values that can be blended or fused or otherwise uh, brought together to uh, form a new thing, not by, as I said, in the collage operation where you forcefully put one thing next to another, but by taking one value, taking the other value, and calculating an average, which is a kind of mathematical equivalent of a, of a chemical operation, not a physical operation or, or a mechanical operation. Um, <clears throat> that idea is, uh, now these are from the, the video, I should, I should observe, these are now uh, some of my worlds in motion, and we'll, uh, we'll hook up to them again uh, later on, just, uh, just an aside. Okay, now this image is an image that was made, this image and uh, this one also, uh, are images that were made for the cover of a pamphlet architecture that I worked on, on uh, architecture as a translation of music. Uh, music, you'll see, figures both in here and in here as an animating principle. Uh, what this image is, is uh, this kind of fusing together of all the images in the book uh, to create a cover that is representative of all the contents of the book and yet is its own thing and that is created by this process of uh, thinking of the images as kinds of fields and fusing the fields together to produce uh, an overall effect which is, uh, in my estimation, uh, radically unlike uh, the modernist uh, method of putting things together. So there's this concern about what characterizes our age, how do we know the world, how do we build images and eventually spaces uh, that reflects that way of knowing. Um, okay, now uh, in, uh, in the next things that, uh, in the following slides, in the following uh, part of this talk, what I want to do is uh, go through a series of steps that have taken me from uh, producing the kinds of designs that uh, architecture students produce uh, of buildings and using representations and uh, methods that are uh, the kinds of things you, you expect in architecture school. Uh, or in conventional architectural practice, I suppose, to the kinds of things that I'm doing now. Um, <clears throat> these are some of the earliest things uh, that I did. I was working with computers and uh, at the same time learning about uh, 20th century music and its radical uh, re-evaluation of the discipline of music. And I was observing that architecture had no equivalent, that architects were using computers not to challenge themselves or their discipline, but simply to become more uh, instrumental and more productive in a kind of uh, pragmatic way and not necessarily a conceptual way. Uh, so I took it upon myself to, to not do that, to find out what the equivalent to uh, a computer music would be in architecture. And I started arriving at compositions such as this uh, that were floating, that had pieces that were disengaged, uh, that were uh, unrealizable in, uh, in a physical sense, except by, you know, uh, special devices, sky hooks and such, uh, that might hold different parts together. But the parts were not irrelevant. They were really part of the entire composition. Um, at the same time, I was getting involved in computer animation and, and finding that there was a degree of hyper-reality in a computer animation that made it its own kind of space, its own kind of conception of space, and uh, that, uh, that that was something uh, quite... Uh, intriguing. And so even though it didn't make any sense, I pursued it. Uh, these are uh, the beginnings of the explorations that I've done that have to do with uh, artificial life. There's implicit in the mechanism that produces these things uh, a, an equation of uh, what is beautiful with what is uh, what contains a great deal of information. So essentially what you have in here is a genetic algorithm that takes a description of this object and evolves it over thousands of generations uh, with the, the goal, the survival function of increasing the amount of information uh, in the composition. So initially you start out with a blob and as you proceed the, the, the thing becomes more and more differentiated until finally it becomes an unlikely object, so differentiated that we associate it more with the sculpture or art or uh, architecture. Uh, but again, it doesn't necessarily obey uh, the uh, the world, uh, the, the world's restrictions as we know them. Now, these things move and they are parameterized and that parameterization and the fact that at least in the generative process you could think of them as moving led me to coin the term liquid architecture to describe them. But 
the liquidity was not in the forms. Uh, it was rather in the parameters of the forms and the fact that the parameters could make a, an object such as that change and pulsate. Um, <clears throat> that uh, went on into various explorations of other generative mechanisms and an increasing kind of uh, willingness to uh, sort of disembark uh, and uh, to uh, leave uh, the constraints of, of architecture as we knew it and to explore another domain. Uh, artifacts such as this and uh, a derivative of this that you already saw moving in the video uh, were constructed with uh, an idea of uh, what are called L systems, uh, Lindenmeyer systems, which are formalisms by which people describe the growth of plants, uh, but this time adapted to uh, put together uh, architectonic elements uh, that were structural, not in a literal sort of uh, physical uh, sense of resisting gravity, but uh, compositionally structural. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, there, there are, the, in, in the mechanism, perhaps I should explain the, uh, the artificial life uh, mechanism, there's, a, there's some kind of uh, genetic information, uh, some, some equivalent to DNA or to uh, a gene and a, and a chromosome. And uh, what you have is a random process of selecting a gene. Uh, the gene might be uh, something that specifies a particular dimension or a particular color or some attribute or position. Uh, or the number of, uh, say, legs a spider has, something like that, uh, and uh, picking it at random and then modifying it in a small way, uh, again at random, but within a small step so that the different steps don't cancel one another out, but they, they add up uh, over time, and then having a survival function look at the mutant and decide whether it survives. If it survives, then it can continue to reproduce, if it doesn't, then uh, it's out of luck. Uh, so the randomness comes in there. I don't know if that answers your question. No, I was, I was, you said that when you, when you architectonic as in as in resisting structure. You mean resisting gravity, architectonic structurally, physically? Well, it, um, I, I think it was a gradual thing, and you, you can see, if, if I were to really lay these out in a historical sense, you can see my, my kind of hesitation to give up the horizon or to give up the fact that things are connected or to uh, uh, allow things to overlap in ways that they, they can't overlap in the physical world, and then gradually yielding to that. The, uh, the lesson of... 20th century music is a series of emancipations. Initially, there's the emancipation of tonal from tonality, the emancipation of dissonance. Uh, then there's the emancipation of noise with Varez. The emancipation of dissonance is with Schoenberg. Then Varez emancipates noise, and the futurists do as well. And then uh, if you continue, uh, you get uh, the emancipation from intentionality that John Cage brings in. And when you get to someone like Nantaro that I played uh, some of the music of last time, you get an, even in the emancipation from the human body as performer or even listener. So there's a series of breaking away points. And so in this trajectory, as I'm learning about all these other things, I am also permitting myself a greater and greater emancipations from the constraints of architecture, trusting that there's an integrity to these things that will pay off. But uh, to, to a certain extent, these things are still visionary. There's, there's a kind of hope that there will be electronic space because it's evident in, in uh, animations at this point. Uh, but uh, even for someone like myself who's really involved in this, the, the speed with which we now have an internet in which you can actually visit these things uh, is surprising. Uh, so uh, they start out as being visionary and all of a sudden the, the reality uh, converges upon 
uh, upon the sort of visionary aspect of these. There's also a bit of, of uh, Malevich and uh, his Arctic tones in here as kind of sources. Um, then uh, this goes even further, because in the, in the kind of exploration of what might happen if you let go, uh, especially with the ideas of music, you, you begin to realize that what, what architecture is, is uh, if you trust that architecture contains you as, as a kind of a base level of what architecture is, uh, you can observe that a chord of music, at least I observe, that a chord of music contains me, even if it's in a boombox in the corner, uh, a major chord makes me feel like I'm in a space, and a minor chord makes me feel like I'm in a different space. And I think that architecture does that when it works. Uh, most of the time, most buildings we're in cancel each other out. The, 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 the environment is more like, like tape hiss rather than, than a chord. Uh, but uh, occasionally, it's, it's more than that. So these things are taking literal um, uh, computer music programs, in particular one called Max, and using it to derive this kind of composition uh, of a space that is now understood more as an atmosphere, or increasingly as an atmosphere, and less as an object. At the same time, there are readings that have to do with deconstruction on the one hand, and Deleuze and Guattari and notions of fogs and clouds and flocks and all sorts of behaviors of things that come in particles rather than things that are solid. And in parallel, there's, there's a kind of concern for uh, personality formation and the subject uh, as something that is made up of uh, not uh, uh, a kind of uh, monolithic self, but uh, a kind of distributed self or, or a particle self. So these are expressions of that. Uh, and uh, they continue with you know, just variations on this, trying to, to establish this, this language. Until finally you get to an image like this where the architecture has just completely uh, given up trying to be an enclosure such as this one and is ent almost entirely atmospheric. Uh, there are elements and strands that permeate the space that have to do with uh, notions of space and the notions of field that I'll get to uh, as we go. Uh, the, the only thing that's kind of recognizably architectonic winds up being more of an object or more of a vehicle uh, in the larger space as, as perhaps that big structure is. And the subject is, uh, is taken apart into you know, this kind of uh, smiling, expressive face and then a zillion eyes uh, mapped over here uh, to, uh, to show the presences in a way that is not necessarily uh, anthropomorphic uh, in a kind of uh, full body way, but uh, still uh, suggestive enough that you might know that it's about humans in another kind of space. Uh, now, uh, in, in these slides, what I want to connect to is more about the idea of, of what the world is as we know it, if you are willing to grant that our science is actually something that is valid. I mean, that's, that's even a contested issue among certain kinds of groups, and it's kind of fashionable to poo-poo science. Uh, but in the end, everyone goes to their refrigerator, everyone watches television, everyone does all these kinds of things that wouldn't exist unless we had an understanding of nature that was, uh, uh, you know, functional in, uh, in uh, profound ways. Uh, the, the conception of the world that we have has its origins uh, in probably the period in 1800 or 1830 when, uh, when Gauss uh, initially uh, figures out that Euclid's geometry is not the geometry, but there can actually be alternative geometries. Uh, but Gauss himself winds up being, uh, realizing how radical that proposition is and refuses to publish it. He knows this and doesn't say anything. Thirty years later, uh, independently, a mathematician named Boliai and uh, a mathematician named Lobachevsky uh, arrive at the same conclusion. Boliai is the son of a friend of Gauss's, and he sends Gauss uh, a letter uh, saying, you know, these are the results that my son came up with, can you look at them? And Gauss basically says, I couldn't praise your son because to praise him would be to praise myself. And uh, he basically strikes a devastating blow to Boliai and he kind of tries to shut the issue up. But in the meantime, Lobachevsky has come up with the same kind of results, and he happens to be a Russian noble and, or, or aristocrat and has the means and the wherewithal and the kind of social confidence to go ahead and publish these things. And a new conception of the world 
comes into play where space can be curved and where eventually through the century people realize that dimensions don't have to be limited to three, but there might be more. So by the turn of this century, there's a sense of infinite dimensional, dim oops, dimensional space in, in the work of someone named Hilbert. Uh, now, what's, uh, th this is a, a condition that is really problematic for architecture because architecture so far has kept up with our sort of cosmological understanding or the cosmological understandings of any particular culture and uh, has tried to give expression. But all of a sudden, this is an expression that can't be built. And so architecture, in my estimation, in my sort of polemical uh, statement, backs up and tries to be social and utilitarian <coughs> and loses its relevance. At the same time, 1830, uh, Victor Hugo writes the famous book in which he declares that the book will kill the building, recognizing that information uh, is more vigorous and powerful than the built form in that it can be reproduced much more easily and can be reconstituted much more easily. So we have this, this problem of a rupture. Um, my contention is that this way of knowing the world uh, is uh, one that we can finally begin to address if we accept that architecture is not necessarily only about buildings, or only about build form and materials, but might also be about uh, other kinds of uh, structures. So uh, the other curious thing is that this, these images that I'm showing you are actually available to you. They're pretty astonishing when you realize what they are. They're available to you on the net. I mean, you could go and find this information right now. And in fact, uh, these things are images from animations you can see. And what, oh, thank you. Uh, and what you're seeing here are uh, the collision of gravitational waves uh, generated by black holes. They're phenomena that uh, occur at the speed of light or are thought to occur at the speed of light. And they're created through um, uh, numerical simulations uh, that, are, that render these impossible things. And you and I can see them, which means uh, that they're somehow already present in the public consciousness now, not the entire public consciousness, but you know, uh, uh, the consciousness of those people who would look uh, in a rather easy way. And I think this kind of, uh, th these kinds of things actually become formative. Uh, these things are predicated on the notion of a field of information rather than an object, and uh, on contours within that field that are uh, found by uh, establishing a particular value so that everything on either side of this line is a particular value. So if I, if I were to look at the field, say that would be a number. It's called three. And all the threes in that field, you might think of the field as a kind of grid. And uh, in that grid, there would be threes along this contour, and uh, say fours along the other side of that contour. And you would be able to see form, but the form would be uh, this, uh, this other kind of thing. Now, you, you see the, the, the connection here, this fortuitous connection. This is a project called The Visible Man. It was made by taking a person's body and freezing it inside this liquid and using this machine to cut, cut it slice by slice. It was like a 5,000th of an inch or something like that. So that's actually, there's a person's body in that block. And uh, basically what was done is that uh, as each slice was cut, uh, a, uh, an image was taken. And then all the images could be reconstituted into that form. And as you'll see in the video, Eventually, that allows people to actually cut incisions in a virtual body and get a sense of what would happen if you, if you cut into that body. These are the, the ways we know. Now, what happens for us to know these things is that there is a grid that's overlaid on something, and there's the notion of sampling, uh, sampling and resolution. These are things that we all know in an everyday way through the contents of our CDs. You know, everyone's got CDs. What is actually on a CD? Uh, how does it pertain to the things we make? Uh, especially as architects, and through our conception of space, like this space, uh, not as one made of polygons, but one made of a saturation of, of contours that are within the space that might be the contours of our temperatures, for example, uh, or the contours of intensities of light, or other such contours. So this is how we know some of that uh, world. That's one depiction from current science in terms of uh, the fields of things that are very large. You saw something at our scale. Uh, and this is from the internet. Now, these are, these are wormholes. Uh, 
the notion of a wormhole is that space might be curved. And if it curves, you might think of a sheet of paper. If you curve a sheet of paper, then new proximities are created that wouldn't exist otherwise. So these little uh, hourglass shapes are actually to be understood as uh, parts of a larger sheet that folds over. And as it folds over, uh, there are punctures that allow you to go from this point to that point the short way. There are shortcuts uh, rather than go along the long way. Uh, you might think of technologies that are every day that do this already. The telephone does this. Your cell phone does this. An airport does this. In fact, every tool that we have warps space. So if I need to nail something into the wall and I use a hammer, the functional space I'm in has been warped by the hammer because I have a shortcut for pounding that object into the wall that I wouldn't have otherwise. For example, if I tried to pound it with my fist, I would give up and not do the job. Uh, so the notion of a wormhole that seems very abstract is actually one that we live by. And uh, another kind of instance of this, this sort of popularization of the way we know the world is this other thing from the web, which is a cosmological uh, uh, clock which has to do with uh, uh, relativity. Uh, so you can figure out, you can set your own uh, speed uh, and mass uh, having to do with, uh, with relativity and as a fraction of the speed of light. And this will show you how space warps and how time passes for someone else who's not speeding. So if, if you were to fly off the Earth at the speed of light, what would happen to the, the people uh, around you? How would time differ? Uh, this is a functioning little device that you can get on the net and you can play with. <coughs> another instance, another kind of uh, example of how these strange ideas are actually uh, no longer far away ideas, but they are begging for architectural expression. Uh, and here's the virtual world, and, and uh, that gives us some of that expression. Now, uh, uh, let's, uh, no, not yet. Um, this is an image from M.C. Escher, which shows something else. This is called a Poincaré disc, and it's an attempt to uh, depict uh, a, another c sense of space that comes again from, from, this, uh, from the events of the last century and a half, or almost two centuries now. Uh, what you're seeing here is not just a pretty picture about doves and bats, uh, but uh, an attempt to describe a space where the metric of the space changes as you move so that a scale, if you were to lay it on here, would have increments that weren't equal, but increments that shrunk until finally infinity would be at this boundary. Okay? So it's an attempt to describe infinity in a finite form. Uh, it's an artistic attempt that draws from mathematics that eventually finds its way onto sort of today's culture on the web as a way of depicting information. So this is uh, uh, an attempt to depict uh, the contents of the, of the internet or a particular website uh, in such a way so that you have focus, you can look at the information you want, and you can have context to infinity or to a long way by, by changing the conception of space under which things are depicted. Uh, here's a little close-up of that. So you might be interested in this. You want this to have enough space so you can look at it. But uh, you also want to know that there's a lot of information there and almost no information here. Uh, infinity being now placed at that edge. Uh, these, uh, these notions find themselves in, in all sorts of devices. This is uh, uh, a project uh, called Project X from Apple, which is a kind of two and a half dimensional way of depicting the contents of cyberspace. Uh, just more images of that. Uh, and then uh, they connect finally to uh, images that are more populist than popular. Cyberpark uh, is, a, is a virtual world that looks like a kind of cartoon world in which you can have bodies and uh, in which you can navigate. Uh, now, the, the importance of this is that these strange conceptions of space with wormholes, which is what hypertext links are, uh, take on a kind of popular image uh, and uh, on the one hand connect you know, people to the way we know the world. Uh, on the other hand, perpetuate the rupture because they're not necessarily appropriate ways of describing these strange phenomena. They're simply convenient ways or familiar ways. It, like early cinema imitating theater, uh, this is early, early uh, wormhole space or hyperbolic space uh, imitating uh, old town someplace USA. Uh, then there's the issue of the avatar. There's a kind of sense that we have bodies, that we augment our bodies with technology, 
into cyborgs, and any one of you here who's wearing glasses is already a cyborg. Uh, and if you use any other technology besides that, you're really, you're really done in. Uh, there's no escape. Uh, but eventually, we're actually going even farther to the idea of placing doubles of ourselves in virtual environments. There's a, there's a sort of functioning soldier. And this is kind of funny if you think of it in a game, and not so funny when, when it's part of uh, the Gulf War and uh, people are uh, blowing each other up uh, politely. Um, now, uh, how am I doing here? OK, I think I'll try to speed up a little bit to, to uh, uh, to get on with, uh, with this. Uh, finally, uh, I want to, well, I don't know how finally it is. I hope it's close to finally. Uh, there's a new set of images that I'm going to discuss uh, that have to do with uh, the, the notion of timbre and the notion of uh, uh, how it is that we know one sound from another and indeed one thing from another. If we were to sing the same note, uh, we would still be able to detect uh, the differences in our voices. If we were to listen to different instruments playing the same piece, we would still be able to tell the, uh, the difference between them. And we do this by uh, the notion of timbre. Uh, very quickly, uh, you might think that a sound is uh, this kind of a wave. Uh, and any sound that has this frequency and amplitude sounds pretty much the same. But some sounds sound richer than others. And the reason they sound richer than others is that they have uh, uh, well, their shape is actually more elaborate uh, or more elaborate. And the way you, you move from this shape to that shape to that shape is by adding uh, smaller amounts of higher frequencies, uh, uh, overtones, if you will. Uh, and the richness of sound is given largely by that kind of a phenomena and then other phenomena that shape uh, the sound. Um, an object like this takes that kind of idea and uh, equates timbre with what happens in form and tries to create a form that is made by a bass function and perturbations of that function at higher frequencies. And uh, playing with that, you can produce uh, forms uh, such as these. Uh, now, what you, what you perhaps want to be doing here is uh, looking at these things as a kind of continuum in terms of the, the early liquid architecture uh, objects where what I was manipulating were the parameters of, say, cuboids to these, where what I'm manipulating are no longer uh, the parameters of cuboids uh, or object forms, but the parameters of functions. Uh, so uh, th these are objects that, that get produced by taking functions and adding functions and increasing the kind, you know, having functions as, uh, as base frequencies and other functions as overtones of those frequencies. Uh, uh, by, by this analogy to sound, that uh, I, I'll, I'll make a sound and then I'll add other uh, sounds to it. Uh, and <coughs> instead of evolving uh, relationships between forms, uh, what I evolve now are the, the parameters to a certain function. So there's a certain mathematical function that makes the base form up, and the evolving mechanism takes that function and modifies its parameters so that the, the, the evolved form is now uh, a similar form but with different, uh, a different exponent or a different factor in it. Uh, I, I might, you might see some of this later on. Uh, can we uh, drop the second video in while we're doing this, please? Uh, so these are more forms done this way. Uh, actually, uh, yeah, get, get it ready, but uh, don't start it. Just hold it for a moment. Uh, now, that was modifying functions. In, in this instance, uh, as I said, in terms of how we know the world, could you hold, hold the video? Hold it. Stop. Hello? OK, yeah, just hold it for a second. Uh, so uh, first there were objects, then there were functions. Then there's this notion of understanding the world as a field. This is just a simple two-dimensional example of uh, a function which you can see up here, and uh, a contour drawn at a particular value. So where this function is equal to 1, uh, or where it's under 1, you get it to be black, and where it's over 1, you get it to be white, and you see a form. If you extend this kind of thing uh, to three dimensions, you begin to get a form like this. Uh, and if you uh, 
add the idea of perturbation uh, in one dimension and in two dimensions and then eventually in three dimensions, you might get something of this sort. So you see here an object which is uh, or a function that produces this kind of field. The thing to notice about this as a color image is that uh, these fields uh, and the contours in them are continuous over space. They fill out that uh, area. And uh, the color differences show you that there are shapes within that area that are not exactly equal. They, they vary uh, in interesting ways. And they begin to suggest what we in architecture would speak of as poche, the difference between the interior wall and the exterior wall. Uh, so this combines the notion of a field and the notion of a perturbation of a field, whereas the previous images showed a function and a perturbation of a function. Uh, and then uh, you can take that and find what's called an isosurface. And uh, what you're seeing here is uh, one function that fills up this box, and then three contours in that that produce this shape all at once. Uh, it, there's also an implicit uh, critique of how we use these tools with the understanding that the use of the computer is uh, best when it does a zillion things for each one that you do. And if you're working, on a one-to-one -one basis, you take a function, you, you do an action, it does a thing like you would with, say, AutoCAD, then you're not really using the computer to its uh, fullest. Uh, so here's, here's that uh, same idea. There's a, there's, here's a function, uh, a contour of that function gives this sort of not quite a cube. In the video, it'll be called a cube, but it's not. Uh, and then here it is perturbed by another function in x, perturbed in xy, perturbed in xyz. And then uh, once you get into the knack of sculpting these things, you produce something like this all at once. This is one single expression. It's not as if I sat down and decided that these are going to be openings or these are going to be you know, anything else that they look like. This is just one expression. It takes about two lines. And uh, it, that ties it into transmissibility because a lot of this has to be relevant to the world we're making. And part of the, the world we're making is one of transmission over the internet, say. So, I can transmit two sentences to another computer and have it reconstitute a building uh, rather than sending uh, megabytes of data that, that describe uh, the, you know, I'm, I'm transmitting essentially the order of the building, like the DNA of the building, rather than the actual material of the building. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Here's another image of that, again, single expression, uh, taking all of that. And what you can see in these images is, is that it's actually shade in the sense that it, this is the outer surface. If we went inside, there would be an inner surface to this that would not necessarily be equidistant. It, it's actually much more intriguing than that, depending on the function you invent. Uh, so there's that sense of, of an architectural uh, life to it. These are other forms that are such explorations. And uh, here's a view from, from within. And uh, these images here uh, are uh, about uh, taking the next step. Okay, what you saw in this instance was um, field perturbation of field. The other uh, breakthrough that happened through the, the last century and into this one was the, the recognition of higher dimensions as, as valid places. Our present conception of the universe says that it may have 10 dimensions, it may have as many as 26 dimensions that are curled up upon, upon one another in, in uh, curious ways. Uh, if, uh, if we pride ourselves for our conceptions of space as architects, we really need to look over our, shol our shoulder and see who else has thoughts about space. And once you do, you realize that physicists and mathematicians have been much bolder than architects for a century now. And so I think there's a, there's a, a challenge for us to uh, look at these things, accept them, and find ways to, to find them. So what you're seeing here is, is a series of frames of an object that is proto-architectonic in this view, but it's actually a four-dimensional object. You see a three-dimensional projection of this object, and then you see the, the object rotating in the fourth dimension so that its three-dimensional projection changes. And as it goes through a rotation, you see it changing uh, form. So this is one object, uh, one four-dimensional object having several three-dimensional manifestations. You'll see this happening in, in, uh, in the video as we, as we play it. Uh, but it's good to, to know. Here's the, the four-dimensional object in a virtual environment that I did in, uh, in Canada as part of something called Dancing with the Virtual Dervish. These things are doors that are essentially hyperlinks 
Uh, this is a kind of remnant of the Cartesian or Euclidean system. Uh, and this is that proto-architectonic object that you saw in the previous slide uh, here, rotating, uh, in, the, in the video you'll see it rotating, uh, depending on where you are. So as you move, your, the, the environment is intelligent, knows where you are, and uh, animates uh, this uh, four-dimensional transformation. This is, as far as I know, the world's first uh, immersive experience of a four-dimensional environment. So it's a, it's a little bit of a uh, nice thing uh, for me. I, I feel particularly happy with it, especially since I got it to work at 8.30 in the morning on the day of the conference uh, when I was supposed to speak about this larger project at like 10 in the morning. Um, so uh, I think I had this sort of, sort of flush of exuberant uh, happiness that uh, I'm going to carry with me my whole life. Like, yes, it's working. Um, <laughs> another hyper. Yeah, OK, so let's, uh, let's go to the video now. Now, some of you saw uh, this, uh, the extended version of this video uh, when I spoke here last time. I'll just show you the part that's relevant to this. Could you make it a little louder, please? So this is not a cube, it's one of these uh, other forms, this thing here. But this is a very simplified uh, documentary for public for uh, uh, PBS. With additional algorithms, he creates perturbations that begin to distort the cube into a more complex shape. To which I would say, well, of course, but... <laughs> These are ISO contours taken from a field, so you'll see that the object will diminish magically. It's the same object. I'm just picking different values in, in the field that I've designed. And this is four dimensional. Unlike physical structures, they can breathe and pulsate. He animates his worlds with four dimensional. I think we can never know enough mathematics. I wish I knew a thousand times more. But every mathematics is, is about numbers. That's what arithmetic is about. Mathematics is about structures, possible structures. Virtual reality is about visiting possible worlds. Thank you. 
four-dimensional world. That's in the center. The four-dimensional world is a restless kaleidoscope of geometric patterns. Okay, let's uh, let's pause that there. It it goes on, but uh one of the thrills of this is really being able to uh literally share. Uh we can actually let it uh let it play but turn the volume down so that people can, can watch but not necessarily listen to to what it says. Um I'll get out of the way in a moment here. Uh, so here are more of these uh, four-dimensional things. What you're seeing here is, uh, is now different people uh, entering this world. And what's interesting about that is that uh, there's a connection between these kinds of things uh, and our mind, the spaces of consciousness and what it is that we inhabit in our heads and the possibility of sharing those. Uh, when you begin to share it, and especially when you begin to share it over the net, you start being involved in the construction of a public consciousness or a kind of global consciousness uh, that will have repercussions that we can barely anticipate. I mean, it's really uh, a dizzying thought to wonder what will happen when we can each enter each other's uh, imaginary uh, spaces. Uh, now, uh, these are more stills from these worlds. I've just got a few of them to... to I'll show you them in a sort of higher resolution. Uh, these are more L systems worlds. There are various plays in this piece that have to do with uh, this sort of citadel existing in a huge heart. Uh, elsewhere, there's a, a large architectural composition with a tiny heart, and the different portals exist in them, and it has a kind of peculiar language of its own in terms of how it speaks. These little li lines pulsate. Uh, they're, they're, t they're sort of evocations of pulsars and also uh, things that create a heartbeat in the, in the space that coordinates the different spaces together. Um, uh, I won't comment much more on these except to get to this image and to say that in most of the things that I make, even though they seem so abstract, there is this, uh, always this kind of remembrance of the physical world, which I enjoy dearly, uh, but which is also problematic. So that there's a part of these worlds that looks kind of escapist and uh, uh, sort of uh, fantastically uh, uh, beautiful in a, in a certain kind of way. Uh, and then there's a counter tug of memory. In this case, these are people uh, whose images were found in the uh, Gestapo files in Athens uh, who had been uh, forgotten. I mean, no one knows who they are. Uh, sometimes they have a first name. Uh, they're, they're just kind of lost people whose only remnant is a photograph of disfigurement. And they're stuck in these worlds and they flash in juxtaposition with images of commerce and images of kind of uh, uh, cover, um, magazine cover happiness uh, to, to create a counterbalance of, uh, of memory. 
uh, that I think is necessary in, in, uh, in this kind of work. Uh, okay, so these are more of these worlds. There's that heart in the larger uh, architectural composition. Um, uh, this is a, a different set of worlds that are on the internet that uh, uh, address the issue of uh, convergences of uh, space and music and literature. So this is a kind of three-dimensional poem. Uh, you link through these, these phrases, and as you link, if you have the memory to recall what the, li what the words say, you construct your own poem. Um, and, uh, okay, now we can, uh, we can stop this video and go back to the previous one, please. Um, if you, if you look through, through here, uh, this pr the memory in this uh, set of worlds is of cities of disaster and of things that we would rather forget, like disease and uh, illness and mortality. Um, there are remnants in these worlds also of the Cartesian system and of uh, space as we know it, indicated by these warped coordinate systems that are uh, placed according to different fields. Um, but the... Uh, the next step in, in this uh, work, uh, I'm j I'll just go through these quickly. Uh, the next step in, in all of this is to go uh, one step further and to question not only the, the idea of a field, but the nature of space itself, to actually begin to take on the idea of curved space as a way of uh, deriving an architecture, and the idea of dimension, and to combine, which I've already shown you, really, uh, and then to think of uh, four or higher dimensional kinds of things uh, in a space that is warping. Uh, so when, uh, when, you, when you leave these things behind, what you need to be remembering is that any particular object that you see is actually understood as something that has a parameter of time built into it so that as, as time increments, uh, the object uh, transforms, whether you see it in any particular instance. Uh, that is always the, the underlying assumption. Uh, the, uh, and, and then the, the linkage of these conceptions of space with uh, the uh, visualization of information. Uh, what, uh, what you're seeing here is uh, going to sound as an aside momentarily. There's a lot of information on the net and no one knows quite how to visualize it. This is an attempt uh, for a study that I did with a government organization in Canada for uh, giving information memorable shape so that each node is uh, perhaps a, a bookmark or a file or uh, something that is on the net. Uh, th th every document that you retrieve from the net has data and metadata, the data about the data. So this is in a sense the exterior of cyberspace where a page that you retrieve is the interior. Uh, the connectivity of things is the exterior. And this is an attempt to take the the constructional methods that I've been developing and to try to visualize a space uh, this way. So uh, then here's, here's one of these uh, spaces. And if you were to warp the space itself now, the, the actual substructure of space in which this exists, you would create uh, an, uh, an artifact that has the same connectivity you know, it's ba this is basically the same object. The object hasn't changed. The space itself, the, the underlying matrix of space, is what has changed, and this is what we witness. Um, these final slides that I have here are uh, just some more recent uh, attempts. They're more in the, on the order of sketches. They're nothing complete. But what you're seeing here is uh, a rather simple three-dimensional, um, uh, so it's, it's kind of like a monopoly house if you were to look at it in three dimensions, being taken into the fourth dimension, extruded and rotated, and then brought back into this mangled uh, construct. And then this is a, an even simpler form. It's almost uh, like a, an outline of a cube uh, being taken into hyperbolic space and brought back into this uh, as this warped surface so that uh, this, as a study, is an exploration of these two aesthetics, the higher dimensional and the curved space. Um, in a particular kind of form, uh, then in, in the fullness of this, you would, you know, when it's all working, you would see this thing transforming and, and changing in time if it were in cyberspace. But you could also see it as being uh, a kind of inspiration for physical structures that we could build in the physical world that would give expression to these ideas in, in the world that we can, we can uh, navigate through. Uh, 
bringing things back into the physical world um, is this uh, terminating image which comes from Rodin. It's, a, it's at the Rodin Museum in Paris. And it's the image of Icarus falling. You know the myth of Icarus. He flew too close to the sun and his, uh, his uh, wax wings melted and he fell to the ground. It's a very curious image because it shows Icarus on his back and his psyche being pulled out of him by this other mysterious figure, which might be fate or it might be death or I, you know, I don't know exactly what it is. But you get the effect of a multiple exposure uh, in what is the last material that you would think of having a multiple exposure in, which is marble. Or I'm not sure if this is marble or this is probably plaster, actually. But anyway, a kind of sculptural material that's all about uh, dense physical presence. So uh, the reason I'm showing this is the last image is because in all of these things, there's a sense of co-presence. I, uh, I am here with you, speaking to you. If I had a cell phone, it could ring, and I would be in a different conversation. If I had a tuner in my pocket, and I push the button, I could tune into a radio signal or a TV signal, uh, or into the global positioning system and find out what my coordinates, because the space in this room is not empty. There are actually a million architectures within the same space, just as there are, there are a million uh, figures or positions of these figures uh, inside this kind of conception of the world. And that notion of an architecture that is not only material, but, but both material and virtual, is uh, in the end what all of this is leading to. The name I've given this larger view, which is not only about being in cyberspace, but being in physical space and being connected to the virtual as well, is trans architecture, or an attempt to retain architecture, but to uh, uh, transcend it at the same time. Uh, there's uh, implicit in the video that uh, is uh, conveniently wrapping up uh, behind us uh, is the notion of avatar. And uh, the latest problem or sort of interesting question that, that I've been uh, thinking of and that is implicit in some of the imagery, I didn't really speak to it very carefully, um, is the notion that for the longest time, architects have designed the, the enclosure, the kind of space in which inhabitants inhabit. Uh, with the construction of a virtual social domain, which is multi-user, which is multi-dimensional, and in which you can have social interaction of all sorts, you get the problem of designing the representation of the human being as well as the building. These representations are called avatars. And what is curious about that is that they pose an architectural problem of designing, if you will, the client along with the building. Uh, some architects, like Frank Lloyd Wright, already did that. I mean, if Frank Lloyd Wright could, he would probably have you, uh, you know, correct your manners and how you ate your soup and tell you how to dress when you, when you went to eat it. Uh, that seems like a kind of egomaniacal thing, but the truth is that in Los Angeles, that's not so crazy. There are people who will spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on clothing consultants, wardrobe consultants, and tell them, you know, here's this uh, rather large amount of money. Keep me dressed, because I don't have the time to deal with that. Give me an image that is uh, the image that I would like to present to this part of my life. Uh, it's interesting to think of that as a kind of architectural problem, and. Uh, the catchphrase I've got for that is kind of a, a putting together of the word avatar and the word architecture into avatar architecture. Okay? Convenient. But catchy phrases are important because they become memorable and they become memes. You know, you catch a phrase, it's like catching a cold. You give it to someone else uh, and it spreads. So you've got liquid architecture in cyberspace. You've got trans architecture at the boundary of cyberspace and the physical space. And you've got this notion of avatar architecture uh, as the problem of constructing identity in these virtual spaces. And with that, I think I'll uh, be quiet. And if there is any time, which I think there's not much, uh, I'd like to hear your questions. If we get kicked out, uh, you can ask me questions by email or by some other means. But I would like to hear an echo from you. Thank you.
think of a contour uh, map, uh, you know what a contour line is, right? It's a line at a certain height. If you take that idea of a contour uh, on a two-dimensional map re representing a particular height, you can extend it to a third dimension and find a surface that represents a particular value. It's an approximation of the curve, the curve. No, imagine, imagine that you've got a cube full of numbers, right? And uh, the numbers are, say, they, they range from uh, 3 to 5. And you say, go through this cube and find out where all the 3s are, or even where all the 3 and a halves would be by interpolation. So you find all the 3s, and then you construct a surface that shows you where that contour is. The way if you had a landscape, you would say, show me the line that's at uh, 50 feet from the sea level. Okay? Except that now it's extended to the idea of surface. Uh, whatever I could get my hands on. Uh, some of these things were done, the, some of the earliest things were computed on a Mac Plus and then rendered on a Sun. Uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the large scale sort of uh, moving things were done on Onyxes. Uh, the typical environment that I use is uh, uh, a combination of a Mac and an SGI. Uh, the faster the better. The language I use varies. Some of the early things were done in Pascal, other things were done in C or C++. Later things were done in Mathematica, and now things are I'm playing around with Java. Um, but uh, the, the real answer to that is uh, sort of uh, developing a hacker code, which is that you use what you have and what works, uh, or what can be uh, subverted into working. So I've used, to, you know, to give you an example, there's a lot of John Cage in here uh, as well that I didn't mention. Uh, so if it came down to it, I would, you know, there's a search and replace function in your word processor, right? If you use it uh, as you're supposed to, you find, uh, you know, where you didn't capitalize a word and you replace, replace something. But if you think about it, you can use that to construct elaborate formal systems that create the instructions that you can then put into form Z uh, to make something that you couldn't have made otherwise. So a lot of this is, is that kind of guerrilla uh, attitude to, to different programs. Uh, I spend a lot of time doing and then teaching my students to be agile about taking the output of a program and putting it into another program and then taking the output of that and putting it into something else and constructing a virtual machine that is none of the programs that we have at hand. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I went to, for, for, I grew up in, I was born in Venezuela, grew up in Greece, wound up in Ohio for odd reasons that have to do with growing up in a quasi-Greek family, which is that you go to wherever your family is. And I happened to have an aunt in Cleveland, of all places. Uh, I don't know why she decided to go there and why I spent so much of my life there, but so it was. And then the closest school of architecture happened to be Ohio State, and that was another kind of Greek thing to do. You kind of hung near your family. Uh, that turned out to be really fortunate because I was at Ohio State at the same time when Chris Yesios was setting up his program uh, on computer-aided design. Chris Yesios is the person who designed Form Z. And uh, so I got to take some of his courses and I was, what was interesting to me was that I was actually learning something. That sometimes in a school of architecture you get the feeling that you're learning to think but you're not learning a content. Right? I mean, you're, you're learning a kind of dynamic way of solving problems, but you're not necessarily learning information. And with computers, you're actually learning particular things. You know, you're learning something about the mathematics of something. Or there was also a sense of learning another way of thinking that, that had rigor in it. If you didn't write the program well, it didn't work, period. I mean, it didn't matter what kind of uh, theoretical spin you put on it. There was a bottom line. It didn't work. Uh, at the same time, uh, there was at uh, Ohio State a rather famous, uh, in computer graphics circles, group called the Computer Graphics Research Group that was unusual in that it brought together computer scientists and artists in the same environment uh, for the making of artistic projects and projects that would uh, 
get uh, National Science Foundation funding, uh, which is how they, they paid to do the art projects. And uh, so it was a curious mix of people there. And I took animation courses there and uh, uh, saw, you know, I mean, you've seen these animations of uh, chrome spheres bouncing, you know, like this was the beginning of computer graphics like that, ray tracing. And uh, things that we assume as mundane at that time had this kind of transcendental aura about them. It was like being in the mind of the Buddha and seeing a hyper reality. And then, of course, I was in a school of architecture, you know, and I was learning about all the constructivists and about all the heroic things in the modern movement and wondering, well, gee, you know, if I wanted to be heroic, what would I do? Well, everything had been done except this. You know, here was a, here was a, a new conception of space, and uh, architects, as far as I could tell, were being completely reactionary about it. They were poo-pooing anything that had to do with computers. It wasn't up to our magical standards. Well, it wasn't. It was pretty crude. That was, that was true. But it could be you know, if someone applied themselves to it. And uh, so there I was. What else could I do in Ohio? I, I got deeper and deeper and deeper into this. Um, at the same time, I had this kind of, which I still do, this kind of appetite for books and information that is insatiable. So I was browsing all the time and uh, doing more things outside school than in school. And eventually found myself loving architecture, loving computers, and loving music, and, uh, which I, I haven't mentioned yet and uh, not knowing how to, how to be alive and pursue all of them. And so I said, okay, there's one way to do this, and that is to declare that they are all one, you know, by fiat. You know, this is it. <laughs> These things will be one, I say so. And, uh, you know, then and allowing myself to kind of continue and uh, see where it goes. And so, um, so I knew a, th a few things about computers. Uh, then I, I, I finished my undergraduate there. I was offered to be uh, a TA in the design studio, a regular design studio. And at the same time, I got into the graduate program for doing these kinds of things, which was kind of a computer science, largely computer science program. So I think I was one of the very first people who had actual studio experience of the sort that you're having here. And at the same time, was getting deeper and deeper into uh, serious computer science stuff. Um, which was crazy making, you know. I mean, the first time I walked into a computer science course in the computer science school, I walked out. You know, I, I thought the, the social situation, the way things were taught was alien, and I wasn't gonna put up with it. Then I went home and said, oh, shit. And, uh, and I went back. Uh, so that allowed me to be offered a position as an assistant professor in the Department of Industrial Design because they were going to get a lot of computers that uh, they didn't know what to do with. And presumably I did, and I also knew how to draw you know, and, and do things in the studio, which they figured was a good backup plan. It turned out to be a good back, backup plan because they never got the three quarters of a million dollars that they thought they would get, and we were always struggling with inappropriate equipment. Uh, but that gave me, you know, this moment of uh, luxury. You know, I didn't have to graduate and go work for an architect uh, and therefore abandon any kind of hope of doing this uh, at that time. Um, anyway, the, the machines never came. I decided to come here uh, to do a PhD, got deeper and deeper into music. Um, and uh, in the process of coming from Ohio to UCLA to work on this PhD, I wrote a paper that was very critical of how architects uh, dealt with computers. And I thought, you know, I'm going to get burned for this. You know, they're going to throw this out. And because uh, I was saying, you know, basically, uh, you know, the people that are using computers in architecture don't know anything about the theoretical stuff that's interesting. They don't know anything about the art and the aesthetics that's interesting. And they, they don't see any connections with other fields like music that are using this in interesting ways. Uh, you know, what's going on here? And uh, blah, blah, blah. Well, I got a phone call saying, uh, we received your paper. Would you like it to be the keynote paper in this conference? So much for my being a rebel. Um, so, so I said, sure, of course. And I gave this presentation, and the word got around. So by the time I came here to do my PhD, I'd been here for a short while, and the phone rang in my advisor's office and I was offered a position at uh, the University of Texas, where Michael Benedict was just beginning to organize a conference on cyberspace, the cover of which was the first slide that you saw here. 
Cyberspace had had a, a name from the Neuromancer novel since 84, and this was uh, late 80s, almost 90, uh, when this was happening. Uh, but, you know, and I knew the book, and I, you know, I had thought, well, wow, you know, Gibson is, is writing about the things I'm doing, but it was still a kind of visionary proposition. But what happened was that um, it, that thing brought together a lot of people. The book itself was instrumental in giving a kind of uh, validation and identity to this kind of work. And then the internet, which had been going on since 1969, was on this uh, rise, this uh, exponential growth. And uh, all these things fell together so that things that appeared to be visionary uh, and, and still are, I mean, there's, this, this still gets me into trouble all, all over the place. But at least now I have concrete things to show. So, you know, th this is happening and you, you can point your browser to it. Real. It's real trouble now. Yeah, right. It's not just some guy piping off someplace. Uh, so anyway, there was a kind of historical convergence that, that I was lucky enough to, to uh, be a part of. But it's, it's going to be going on for a long time, so it's by no means exhausted. In fact, uh, you know, if, if you know what I know, you know if you looked at the, the news I saw uh, yesterday and today and the day before, it's like I sort of tune into different channels, you'd see that if anything, this is, you know, this is at this part of the curve. This year, it's going to jump like that. And uh, by a couple of years, you're, you're all going to be offered the opportunity to do this. Uh, and uh, to think farther uh, along, if you're open enough to do it. If you're not, it's going to go to those people that are open enough, because it's going to happen somehow. Anyway, excuse me, what's my email? Uh, good question. Marcos, M-A-R-C-O-S, at AUD, Architecture and Urban Design, dot UCLA dot edu. And if you go to the UCLA architecture page, you can find me through there. Anyway. I have a kind of question to you. You know, if someone could, uh, or a few of you could uh, tell me if this stuff seems really removed from your reality, if it seems like it's, uh, uh, you know, pie in the sky kind of stuff, or it's actually, yeah, I mean, we, we accept that it, it's done. Uh, how, do you, how do you take this? How are you... How are you seeing it? How do you connect it to your experience? Yeah. Well, where would be a very natural question for this, because the inherent um, characteristic of both the internet and the, the spatial assumptions that form our scientific view of the world are increasingly non-local. They're about not where, as we understand it. And also, uh, as far as we can tell, everything seems to break down into relationship and not material. So it's also not body. So you're, you're right that you know, there's this discomfort about uh, someone pulling the carpet out of your fundamental assumption. You know, I am here now, and this is telling you there is no here and there is no now, and there is no body. Um, but isn't it true to, your, to what you observe in your everyday life if you look at it that way? 
you know, this is this is a question that baffles uh, everyone, <laughs> uh, including people who are recognized and think of themselves as architects and have done so for a long time. But for most disciplines, uh, you can answer in a pretty straightforward way why the discipline exists. So if I ask why medicine, well, you know, there's a kind of easy understanding why people, why why humanity would have developed a particular body of knowledge that way. Uh, it seems to me that architects have a harder time saying why architecture. Uh, but if you if you attempt to, even if you say that architecture is, you know, the why of architecture is to sell houses in a crass kind of commercial way. If you have the answer, then you also know what to do. The problem arises when you have a history of architecture that, you know, and a kind of ideal of architecture that we all have, and you don't have a corresponding why for it. So why architecture? If you can say why, then you might say what that why would do with the reality that you witness, you know, the kind of tele-reality, tele reality that we have. But, but you'd have to sharpen them. I mean, a submarine is an environment, yes. and a ride in Disney uh, is an environment, yes. and the Pantheon in Rome is an environment. So which environmental design are you speaking of? And these are environments also. Yes. Yeah. All sorts of what crash? Well, so is the physical world. Could you speak a little louder, please? Because uh, I'm losing 